It's the nation's favourite antiques experts. Let the road trip begin. Behind the wheel of a classic car. Ooh, hit the roof then. And a goal to scar Britain for antiques. Pump yourself up with antiques. The aim, to make the biggest profit at auction. But it's no mean feat. That's a top job, isn't it? There'll be worthy winners. £400. Fantastic. And valiant losers. I'm screaming on the inside. Will it be the high road to glory? The gloves are off. Or the slow road to disaster? The gearbox is gone. This is the Antiques Road Trip. Get away. It's the second instalment of our Super Scottish Mini Break with a couple of the country's biggest supporters. David, I absolutely love the sort of misty morning and the sun's just peaking and I can see a few cobwebs. It is very atmospheric, it really is. Our misty mountain shoppers <laughs> are David Harper at the wheel and in the co-driving cobweb spotting role, Izzy Balmer. <laughs> Great Scottish roads here, Izzy. So bumpy. But don't worry, because you're in a classic mini and classic minis go anywhere. Really? Almost. But let's not push it, shall we? This one's a 1983 vintage. Oh, oh! Don't panic, don't panic. David from Barnard Castle is a dealer whose antique interests range from the 1770s to the 1970s. Hello. Cool. While Bristolian Izzy is an auctioneer for whom antiquity is any one, albeit important, part of the package. I just think he's got a really nice face. And it's her methods that seem to be paying off thus far. I'm pleased. Is he nice? Yeah. With, at their first auction together, David making a string of losses. That's devastating. We're still in the honeymoon period, but I realised this morning this is the worst start to any antiques road trip I think I've ever made. Does it give you an element of confidence? Do you think this guy, look, he's just had it. He's, <laughs> he's a complete loser. <laughs> Bit of an overreaction, David. We've definitely seen worse. David started out with £200, and after one slightly disappointing day at the sale room, he now has £148 and 42p. While Izzy, who began with the same sum, lost a few pounds herself, but she is out in front with £186 and sixpence. Well, what about you? Um, well... <laughs> Sorry. Oh. <laughs> Good breaks on these things as well, by the way. Just you so just you fancy know. testing oh, them out. Testing them, yeah. <laughs> Our pair's runaway ramble began in the borders and today takes in Glasgow and its environs before heading out eastwards towards the coast and on to the highlands. Then it all comes to a thrilling conclusion at Journey's End in South Queen's Ferry. Oh, 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 there's a bit of water coming through. Is there really? No, <laughs> it's not. <laughs> Later, they'll be heading into the big city, but we start out in a wee hamlet, Rosebank. Beside the River Clyde. At the Clyde Valley Antique Centre. And Garden. He's on his own in here. Alan, good to see you. Hi, you, David. Well, can I just dive in? Of course you can. Yes. Maybe best to wait a bit before revealing quite how limited the funds are. There's bound to be something, though. Oh, what a good-looking cabinet. Fascinating bit of African art there. Necklace, ten quid, cheap enough, quite bonny. What is it? Islamic Seluk. Seluk. That's a thousand years old. If that's real... That is seriously 1,000 years old for a tenor. Let me have a look at this. So, little drops of glass with what looks like later beads, I think. How do they know that is original Islamic 1,000, 1,200 years old? Hang on. Certificate of authenticity. There we have it. The Seljuk Empire included Mesopotamia, Syria, Palestine and most of Iran. Well, that is so cheap, it's painful. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to just put the certificate on top of the glass bead to disguise it back in the cabinet so it's nice and safe. Let me just have another quick look around and I'll come back for it. That's not going to make anyone the least bit curious, I'm sure, David. Now, let's catch up with his chum, just about to venture into her first shop of the day in the town of Coatbridge, birthplace of Mark Miller, 
the comic book artist who created Kick-Ass. At Furniture Fusion, sounds a bit like a superpower. Time for Izzy to demonstrate hers. Getting several good things for less than £186, that is. Not to mention wearing big boots and walking in a straight line. I was hoping that there was a signature on the bottom because mid-20th century Scandinavian glass is really, really popular. Now, this certainly has the look. It's got these perpendicular flat sides and then it's got this bubble in the centre. And everything about this screams Scandinavian design except for the sides, which have a bit of a Whitefriars influence to them. A London glassworks. But I just think it's really cool. I mean, it's got a good weight to it as well, which is generally a sign of quality when it comes to glass. It's £10, which is an absolute bargain. But after the last auction, maybe I'm just wanting to play it safe a little bit. And there's the lucky proprietor. Hey, Rob. Hi there. Now, I'm afraid, because everything is so very reasonably priced, I'm not going to be spending a huge amount of well, money. that's OK. I found this vase. It's £10. I'm just going to give you £10 Fantastic. for it. Fantastic. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. 176 left. Have a great day. And yourself. Bye-bye. Cheers now. Back to our other superhero in Rosebank. I bet he'd love a cape and tights. He's come up with an Islamic necklace, also for £10. Any other super finds? Oh, the, oh my goodness me. Gosh, making my mouth water. Right. Now, you have heard of the Ming Dynasty. So this is a 276-year period from 1368 to 1644. So this little character is several hundreds of years old. He is an attendant. He's made out of terracotta. He's got little bits of residue earth on him, and I'll get to that in a minute. And then he's glazed in the typical Ming Dynasty glaze. The Ming Dynasty were responsible, among many other things, for some of the most famous sections of the Great Wall. And he's holding a rabbit. So this fella was made during the year of the rabbit. And he's priced at 85 pounds, proving to you yet again that age has nothing to do with value. And the reason why he's worth so little, in actual fact, is because he was designed to look after the dead spirit forever, underground and in the afterlife. And the Chinese buyers don't like these objects. They're not buying them back. But he's holding the rabbit, which is incredibly rare with these Ming Dynasty funereal pieces. So I think he's a good thing. He is amazing. I would buy him all day long. Time to talk to Alan. Alan. Hi, David. I've got to be honest, I'm desperate to do a deal. Right? But I'm going to be really honest and tell you that I only have £150. That's fine. No, no, no! You've got to let me finish here. 150 quid to buy loads of really good things, this being the first of them. So, that's 85. Right. And I want to pay... 50. I could do 60 for you. Fantastic. Help you out. I'll have him. Now, in the cabinet at the back there, there's a uh -huh. little necklace, and it's got a ticket of 10 quid on it. Uh -huh. So I'm just going to have that as well. That's fine, yeah. Making £70 in total. Great to see you. Thank you, David. Cheers. Thank you. Right, cheers. Which leaves him with 78. So, while the Antiques Mobile reverses out of Rosebank, we'll find out where Izzy's got to, taking full advantage of a fairly common Scottish weather forecast, namely windy just outside the village of Eaglesham, where she's come to visit the largest onshore wind farm in the UK and find out about a Scottish Victorian power pioneer from Professor William Leithhead. Hiya, Bill. Oh, hi, Izzy. How are you? Very well, thank you. Welcome to Whiteley. Thank you for having me. There are 215 giant wind turbines here at the wind farm generating enough power for 350,000 homes. But it all began with one man back in 1887. The gentleman who built, designed and tested the first wind turbines was called James Blythe. He 
He was born in Marykirk, where his father was a local innkeeper, and he went on to study mathematics and natural philosophy at Edinburgh University. Natural philosophy is what we tend to call physics today. It was a time of great social change. You had the development of steamships made with iron, and you also had the development of railways. So there was the need to have lots of energy to drive all this. In 1880, Blythe took up a post at Anderson's College, Glasgow, which later became the University of Strathclyde. There, he began experimenting with the exploitation of wind power, describing fossil-fueled steam engines as wasteful middlemen. He built about six or seven different turbines, and the, the first one that was really successful was the third one he built, and right. that he installed in his garden of his holiday home in Marykirk. And he later offered to light the streets of the village, but unfortunately, all the locals weren't very happy about it, and they said it was the work of the devil. And oh. he, didn't, so he used electricity simply to light his own house. In 1895, he developed a commercial wind turbine, which was sited at Montrose Asylum, and that was used to back up the normal electricity supply. Blythe's first experiments had been based on Dutch windmills, but the Montrose turbine was different. He took inspiration from anemometers, wind speed measuring devices. They rotate around a vertical axis, and there are cups on it which are driven by the wind. Now, you will have experienced wind when you're walking along, and if there's a gust of wind, it'll blow you over. Mm -hmm. That is drag. So the third one and those beyond that were all drag devices which mimicked the anemometers. Blythe's innovations were pronounced not economically viable, and there wouldn't be another wind turbine built in the UK until 1951. But fortunately for the planet, one European nation did not stand still. The first serious exploitation of wind power was by Denmark, and in 1918, they had about 3% of their power from wind turbines. During the Second World War, the Danes didn't have any fossil fuel, so the Danish government funded the development of some wind turbines. But by far, the, the biggest impact on the development of wind power was the Arab-Israeli War in 1973, which was followed by a very large hike in the price of oil. And the other thing which is driving it forward is concerns today over global warming. Well, it's been absolutely fascinating to stand amongst a working wind farm and to hear about the legacy of James Blythe. I'm going to go and enjoy the sounds and the beautiful turbines. Bye-bye. Yes. <laughs> Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye. Back to the shopping and back to her fellow tripper. Have fun in the Mini. I've got to say, it takes me back to my teenage years, driving around in little old Minis like this. It's a time-travelling machine and it's got a cracking heater and, oh, hello, it's just gorgeous. David's off to his very next antiquing opportunity in the settlement they called Scotland's largest town. Renowned for its radical politics and the Paisley Pattern Shawl. Just £78 left to spend in Baileys, remember? Their tagline, we sell old things. Oh, I do like a good cabinet. Look at that. Oh, open. Unusual for good cabinets. 20 quid. Wedgwood brooch. English pottery. Make sure it is Wedgwood. There is the marking. OK, so that just tells you everything you really do need to know. It's just super quality. So this is Jasper Wedgwood. But what Josiah Wedgwood is also known for is he was a great philanthropist, so he really looked after his workers. And during the Georgian period, this was really unusual. So he's one of my all-time British Georgian heroes. The son of a Burslem potter, Wedgwood was also a prominent abolitionist. I would say this probably dates to 1880, 1890, and it's just a really good classic thing. It's very stylish, it's got the brand, it's got the box, and it's got the value. 
20 quid. And in honour of Josiah Wedgwood, I'm having it. Very well. He'll have to have a word with Ben. Not just yet, though. Oh, this is a proper old routing box, this. I'm going to remove my glasses because they're just going to fall off. So if they've removed and I'm working close quarters, I don't need them. That is a clock for a vintage car. And you would find this in one of the cars that we use on the Antiques Road Trip if it was made pre-Second World War, which is when this thing dates to. And this is your timepiece fitted within the wooden dash, and then you've got this rod and twister on the base, and this will set the time and also wind the clock. So this is a manual wind. So you'd wind it simply. Let's see if it works. Listen to that. This is the sound of circa 1935. And then to set the time, you pull this lever and twist. I'm twisting, and it's not moving. OK, so that's not working. Welcome to the world of classic cars. Almost certainly repairable and priced at £10. Who will pay more than £10 for this clock? Well, I'm going to tell you, loads of people will pay more than 10 quid. They would pay 50 quid, 80 quid if they needed it. There you go, Smith's clock, 1935. £10 note. It is going into auction. Ben. Hello. Two purchases, please. OK. Funky Smith's clock. I think that's a bargain. Ten quid and it's ticking. And then a cracking little Wedgwood oh, brooch. Yeah. Isn't that a bonny thing? It's lovely, yeah. £30 in total. Thanks a lot and we'll see you Appreciate again. Appreciate it. Thanks. See you soon. Good luck. Cheers, Ben. Thank you. Leaving him with £48 and 42p for tomorrow. Time for our Tartan 2 to compare notes. Do you have any Scottish heritage? I don't believe that I do. Well, I do, Macintosh. Yeah. My grandmother was a Macintosh, so I probably could trace back if I really tried very hard to Rennie Macintosh. That would explain your artistic flair. What was Charles Rennie Macintosh's taste in trousers like, though? Nighty night. Next morning, their little motor is the subject of lively debate. Well, I feel like we need to name our car. What are we going to name it? Well, I'm not sure. Have you got any ideas? Mini. Mini, mini me? Mini me? Mini me's quite good. Is it a mini me or a mini me? No, it's a mini you. Well, Izzy's shopping was certainly quite mini mal yesterday, <laughs> with only some Scandinavian studio glass acquired. This certainly has the look. Which leaves her with almost £180 at her disposal. While David plumped for a Ming figurine, a Wedgwood brooch, an Islamic necklace and a car dashboard clock. It's almost a piece of art to me. Which means he has less than £50 left in his wallet. Yeah, I've got four things. I was absolutely on fire. <laughs> Ta-da! Wow. It's a Ming Ding Donger, that's what that is. I love it. It should be worth thousands of pounds, shouldn't it? How much do you think I pay for it? I think you pay... 40 quid. Oh. Well, you did ask. Today's shopping experience revolves around just one mighty Scottish metropolis, namely Glasgow. And that's the city's magnificent Spanish Baroque-style Kelvin Grove Art Gallery and Museum. But, as they're unlikely to be selling, Izzy's come here, having dropped off her mucker. She bought very little yesterday, remember? So, at real deal, there's really plenty of catching up to do. And the dude in the hat, that's Michael. Despite putting my big shoes on today to give me a bit more height, I'm still not quite tall enough to see that picture up there. But what's caught my eye about it is that it's a ship at sea. And I really like ships at sea pictures. The Victorian ones, it's a bit hit and miss. They can do well and they can sink. Boom, boom. Terrible pun, I know. Couldn't resist. From what I can see here, this one's a watercolour. It is signed down the bottom there. Can't see. It looks more like a monogram, actually. Condition looks all right, given that it's a Victorian watercolour, possibly early 20th century. The frame is a little bit damaged. That's possibly putting it 
politely, but it's priced at £40, so it's not expensive, but certainly one to ponder because I do quite like it. You wouldn't get deals like that at the Kelvin Grove. We always forget to look outside the front of a shop. It's an ice cream container. That is fab. I absolutely love ice cream, particularly on a day like today. And I'm trying to think what my favourite flavour ice cream would be. I do like a good chocolate ice cream, but this is absolutely fab. I mean, I just love the fact that this would have just been chock-a-block full of ice cream. Oh, it's so bright. I wonder how many scoops of ice cream this would contain. Yeah, 20 litres at 20 scoops a litre. My rough estimate, 400. I mean, this has seen better days. It's a little bit battered and bent. And, oh, there's a price. It's £22. But I am 100%, I think, 100%, I think, definitely going to get this. Two highly likely purchases already. Actually... Hang on. Something else has just caught my eye out here. It's a bijouterie table. There's one similar inside. Go take it inside and see if it is a pair. More scoops? Now, if I am not mistaken, I think... Well, I think they might be a pair. Near enough. Pretty close, aren't they? Now, these are bijouterie tables, which is basically a fancy way of saying it's a display table. It has a glass top, invariably will also have glass sides. Now, I haven't seen bijouterie tables this small before. Usually, they're much more at a usual table height. These are very simple. They're 20th century. £48 each. I don't think they're Edwardian. I don't think they're quite as old as that. But, you know, they're nicely made. And there's a pair of them there, which is quite unusual. Here we go. Michael? Mm-hmm? I've seen a few bits that I'm interested in, but I'd like to start with the bijouterie tables. Yeah. They're priced at £48 each. I have noticed there's some fairly significant scratching to them. Right. What can they be? 75. 75 for the two. Can we do 60 at all? 60, yeah, that's very OK. Now, there's a Victorian watercolour at £40. What oh. can that be? Uh, £30. And then also outside, there's this ice cream tin. That one's priced at 22 Probably do that for 15 Well, I'm going to say definitely yes, please, to the ice cream tin and the tables. So that's 75 I'll do that for 25 and then that'll... Oh. <laughs> 25, 75, so that's 100 quid. Well, do you know what? You have been more than fair to me, so I'm going to say yes, please. A nice round £100, which leaves her with 76 and an awful lot of stuff to squeeze into a mini. I think David might end up sitting on the ice cream tin. <laughs> and speaking of her fellow tripper, you know, the one who's got a bit of Clan Macintosh in him. Well, he's here to find out more about another member of the family from the Glasgow School of Arts, Dr Robin Calvert. Oh, Robin, these are screamingly gorgeous. I assume Charles Runny Macintosh? No, they are not Charles Runny Macintosh. They are Margaret Macdonald Macintosh, wife of Charles Runny Macintosh. They worked in an incredibly similar style, so it makes sense that you look at those and think that they're Macintosh. What an interesting household that must have been. Very much. Ma Macintosh designed their home for them, these beautiful white rooms that Margaret painted in. And according to legend, they even had two little grey pillows on either side of the hearth for their cats named Lancelot and Guinevere. Oh, how fantastic. Yeah. Margaret first came to the city in the early 1890s. I met Charles at the art school soon afterwards. Together with her sister Frances and several other like-minded students, they became exemplars of the Glasgow style. That photograph right there that you're just looking at is a really interesting one. And it's basically a group of women friends and they call themselves the Immortals. Right. Now, Macintosh is there as well. He's perched between these six women and Margaret's at the end there. That one's got Francis doing an interesting sort of a Egyptian pose in the background. And the women wear loose-fitting clothing that's comfortable, that allows them to have more freedom of movement. And then we have an example of a dress. 
I love showing this dress because it tells some incredible stories about the history of the Glasgow style because you can see it has these beautiful kind of arts and crafts leaf motifs to yes. it. It's all hand stitched. And Margaret MacDonald would have worn clothes similar to this. Margaret and Charles married in 1900, and during the early years of the century, the couple collaborated on several important design schemes. One of the most famous of which was the Willow Tea Rooms, recently restored and featuring a replica of Margaret's Gesso masterpiece. Robin, seriously, I'm almost speechless. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? Was Margaret then very involved in the designing of this tea room w with Charles? That's a very interesting question because she wasn't a trained architect. She didn't go into the office to design the buildings. But in Macintosh's mind, he seems to think that she played a huge role in the way he thought about his designs and in the way he worked. He uh, apparently told a friend of his, I have talent, but Margaret has genius. So the theme of the Willow Tea Room is actually based on the name of the street outside. We're sitting on Saki Hall Street, which in Gaelic is Alley of the Willows. And of course, then she could have willow pattern china. But then the Macintoshes pushed it a little bit further. OK, what's going on in the panel? OK, so this panel is called O Ye All Ye That Walk in Willow Wood. That is the first line of a poem by the Pre-Raphaelite painter Dante Gabriel Rossetti. And he's sitting in a wood, a willow wood, by a well. And he sees the face of his lost love rising up from the well. It's about grieving. Margaret died in 1933, a few years after her husband. His reputation grew steadily during the 20th century, but so too, more recently, has hers. She was an extraordinary artist. She has historically perhaps had a lot less credit than she deserves. So it's nice that she's been recognized more, but I'd like for the wider world to know her work. Chin chin. Cheers. Cheers. Meanwhile, elsewhere in Glasgow, Izzy has one more shopping experience to look forward to at the Ruthen Muse Arcade, with £76 left to spend. So, what do we think? Happy face. Happy face. Happy face. Happy face. All smiles. Happy face. All right. Oh, this is really nice. This is a Parker 51, and it was released in the early 1940s. I mean, just look at that. It is so sleek. It's so stylish. It is so on trend. I mean, it could have been made last year. I just think this really is a timeless piece. Now, the Parker 51 was marketed as the world's most wanted pen, and this was alluding to some of the prohibited items as a result of the Second World War. The company's advertising created a demand that wasn't satisfied until years after the conflict ended. I really love the idea of a fountain pen. I think there's something so romantic about the thought of writing with a fountain pen. Now, being a left-hander, it's a bit of a nightmare because I just smudge it all, which is probably why I love the idea of a fountain pen, because I've never really been able to use them. Now, something like this, it's not got its original box. It's probably £30 on a good day at auction, but... You can pick these up in places like this, sometimes for not a lot of money. This doesn't have a price on. Because the cap doesn't match the band, it's a no thank you for me, but I think it's a really good item. And enjoying a revival. And here's his nibs now. <laughs> Just under £50 in reserve, remember? Would you? Just take a look at that Georgian grandeur, late Georgian, 1820, 1830. So this is George IV, the final George on the throne, who died in 1830. It's a decanter in the shape of a mallet. Now, you'll see the mallet as I turn it upside down. See, it looks like a mallet. And then you've got the three ring turns on the neck. That's really quite nice and quite unusual. In immaculate condition, 
and priced at 85 quid. Which means David won't be buying it. It's priced at 85 pounds because it's a particularly good late Georgian decanter. You can buy a particularly plain late Georgian decanter, 200 years old, for a 10 pound note. And you too can be an eco warrior. Nice. Any progress elsewhere, we wonder? Mm. Back amongst the jewellery. Oh, this is really quite lovely, actually. So the chain I would get rid of. In fact, I might even get rid of the chain now. That detracts from the loveliness that I hold in my hand. This is a pigeon racing medal. It's in nine karat gold. And what's lovely is you have this pigeon here, which is hand painted on ceramic. Beautiful. And then Wishaw Flying Club. So Wishaw is a place in Scotland, sort of between Glasgow and Edinburgh. And on the back it says Novice Medal, won by J. Orr, 1924. Now, the medallion itself actually has hallmarks for Chester. If this was Victorian, and if it didn't have any of the engraving, you can be looking at between 100 and all the way up to 250 pounds. This one isn't Victorian. It does have all of the engraving. That being said, there's no price on it. So, I mean, it's got to be worth the question, hasn't it, of how much is it? Got to be. Better call Paul. Hello, hello, Paul. Oh, hi, Izzy. Sorry, I'm interrupting you. No, 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 it's OK. What can it be? Friend to a friend, what can we do on this? I'll do it for 50. Thank you for being such a gent. I'll get you some money. Thanks, Paul. Shopping done with just 20 left. Now, what about David? This is a box full of what looks like costume jewellery, apart from two tiny rings. And the thing I spot immediately is the word war. Now, this is an unusual thing when you think about it to see on a ring. So you've got two rings, First World War, he's bang on. Oh, my goodness me. Wowzer. Crikey. Do share. Right, the first thing I'm going to tell you is this. They are miniature. So this one is inscribed war. You've got the number 14 and 17. And it's likely a trench ring because it's been literally scraped with something incredibly sharp made in the trenches. But what's doubly fascinating is its partner. The one next to it has a German eagle on it, that classic German eagle. So we have a Tommy ring and a German ring. Fifteen pounds for them both. This, no doubt, is First World War II. But let me take you back to the size. Look at the size of those rings. It's my little finger. It doesn't even fit my little finger. Very small people, and people were generally smaller hundred and something years ago. And for fifteen pounds, the pair, I'm going to buy them. Paul, part two. Hey, Paul, looking very busy as ever. Hi, David. Well, I'm going to keep you busy because I'm going to give you 15 quid for these two silver rings. No negotiating. I'm just going to have them. How's that? Yeah. Super. That's him done as well, with 33 left over. Good to see you, Paul. Thank you. Time to get back on the road. The auction's next. Not that they seem at all bothered. Well, I think it's a bit of time for relaxation. How do you fancy it? I like the sound of this a lot. You've got your Scottish trousers on. Got, yes, um, my Macintosh clan. Hello. Kaylee. Kaylee. I love a Kaylee. I love a Kaylee. We could do stripping the willow. Is that what it's called? If you want to do a bit of stripping the willow, that's fine by me. And don't forget the dashing white sergeant. Then, shut eye. It's auction day at Loch Lomond, Britain's largest body of water when measured by surface area and home of the silver dolphin. It's a bit wobbly, is he? Have you not got your sea legs I on you yet? I don't think I do. Look out there. Oh. It is very treat. I'm glad we're nice and warm and cosy and fun. I know, God. Quite keeping close to those bonny banks. After setting out back in Rosebank and taking a tour of Glasgow, they've now headed north of the city to the Loch Lomond and Trossachs National Park. While their purchases have been dispatched towards Halifax and Halifax Mill auctioneers for sale in the room, on the net and on the phone. Today's auctioneer is James Watson. Izzy parted with £160 for her five auction lots. 
So these were a good buy. A bijouterie aspect to it is a winner. People out there will be looking to acquire such a thing. Uh, I expect these to do quite well. David spent just £115, also on five lots. An original Chinese piece, this is probably one of the better things we've had in over the last six months. Obviously, over 500 years old, could do any number. Crikey! Well, it may be damp on the loch, but we're just about ready on board. Right, come on then, let's get performing. First up is Izzy's Scandi Glass, acquired very cheaply. Double drat! <laughs> double so, drat! Yes, double Who drat! Said that? <laughs> I say it, Izzy. Anybody at 20. £20, yes. thank you. He's double got bubbles. it, he's got it. Double bubble. <laughs> double drag. Six in the room, 28 now, sir. So 30, £30 pounds now, 32. £32 pounds and selling for 32. Bang on, and what it is really worth. Yes. So very well found thank you. you. What a good start. This could be great. David's turn. His two World War I rings. 20, 38 now. 38 oh. on the internet. You've double bubbled. Double bubbled. And a bit more. Yeah. Come on, fuck good. Come on. 40 pounds. Go on. And we are selling this pair or 40. Good. I think that's, that's good. That's fine. Yeah. He's making profits as well. How do you feel? Oh, I'm delighted with that. Good. Well done, you. Thank you very much. Izzy's Victorian watercolour is next. A Glasgow ship as well, apparently. That's an original piece of art for 25 quid. That's what I That's thought. Money. Yeah. So 10 pounds then, 10 pounds. Go on. 10 to my left. Looking for 12. 12 That'll do. Darn it. 18, sir. 18 now on the internet. 20, sir, 20 pounds. Thank oh. you. So 20 we have, looking for 22. Is he your face? That's a final warning. Go on, internet. that'll do, is he? Tell him. I'm selling for 20. Oh, wow. Back on the rocks. <laughs> Just when all seems set fair. And I'm delighted it made a bit of a loss. Delighted, is he? I'm not. Now for one of David's cheapest buys, his Seljuk necklace. If it doesn't make profit, I'm going to jump in the lock. I want it to make a profit, but I also want to see you jump in the lock. <laughs> 20. Have we got 20 for this one Surely. to start? Surely. Oh, sure dear. To... I better start <laughs> removing my shoes. <laughs> Well, there's 20 at the back of the room. We've got 20! Oh, Thank goodness for that! I really wanted to see you dive into it's the lot. It's 1,000 it's years old! This one is selling for 20. I'm well, really disappointed. I what really can I say? wanted to see you diving <laughs> into that lock, and it was so close! I might do it anyway. Oh, do. Shame about the necklace, though. Still, a profit's a profit. If I had my swimming trunks with me, I'd be in. But sadly, I don't have them. From budgie smuggling to pigeon racing, Izzy's gold medal. It's a pigeon. People love pigeons. Really? That is a very rare fob, and I'm very jealous and very worried. 50, thank you very much. So 50 bid. 50 yeah. straight in. It's going to go this. 55 now on the internet, 60 now. 75 on the internet now. What You're not going to say it's going to fly, now? are you? I'm Get tempted. Chance, and that's a final warning to but it's not really off. flying, is it? And that's selling 85 now. Well, well it should make an awful lot more money than that. So it's selling then for 85. Well, I think that was really well found, and I think that was a bargain Still price a for somebody. I think it's really well done. Yep. All in all, quite a coup. It was beautiful. Yeah. The hand painting was really stunning. Time for David's dashboard clock. In need of some TLC. It doesn't work. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Who's got 50 for this? Come oh. on, get in there. 50 pounds, 50 pounds. He's got it! On the internet, thank you. David. In the Looking for a couple more bids on this. That'll be nice. Hold you know about your car, so do like my cars. Yeah. Pounds. So that's a final warning, then. Car no people love bids. spending money. Go on! Selling to the internet for 50. Izzy! I've got to take my hat off to you, David. Make that a double doff. Great work. And now, Izzy will be after some lolly <laughs> for this tin. Who doesn't love ice cream? It's my favourite dessert. What's your favourite flavour? Oh, chocolate. £10 in the room. 12 now. 14, sir. 14. 16. Oh, 18 now. profit. Profit. 18, 20 pounds. I can't believe it. Yeah, Izzy Barmer, you are a nightmare to be with. A total nightmare. I'm going to take that as a compliment. But, uh, 22 we have. Room's out for this one. Final warning to the room and the internet. This one's selling for 24, sorry, sir, 26. Yeah, 26. 28 now we have, you sure? So 28. 
Wow. I'll buy you an ice cream, David. I, I really deserve an ice cream. For all the profits you're making. Only if you become nice, David. That's an impossibility. Fair point. Another tasty profit for Izzy, though. I'll make it a double scoop as well. Would you mind? The auctioneer's favourite is next. David's Ming Dynasty funeral attendant with rabbit. I'd be very happy at 120. Well, yes. Yeah. But let's hope he can do a little bit more. £50 pounds to start. Anybody at 50? 50 in the room. 60. 70, sir? 80. Go on. 100. Go on. OK, 110 in the middle. Come on. You've nearly double bubbled. Come on. 120 on the Yes, now. double bubble. Yeah, double bubble. 120 we have. We're at 120 pounds. And that's a final warning then to the room and the internet for 120. There's nothing wrong with a bit of double There's bubbling. There's nothing wrong with a double bubbling. Absolutely, bubble. we like a bit of double bubbling. Oh, we do. Not to mention a Ming Ding Donger. Oh, well done you, Dave. Well, thank you. Now I'm pleased. It's bijouterie table time. There's another one just like it as well. Izzy's last lot. Who's got 50 to start on these? Don't start a 50. Yeah, a little bit of commission oh. interest and I can start that off at 50. So if that... Oh, yes. look at that. Oh. <laughs> right. 50 pounds. Who's got 55? So 55. I've got 60 with my commission. There you go. 65. Oh. 70 with my commission. Whoa, oh, you're into profit. Then we've got 75 behind you. So we're now at 75 in the room. We're looking for 80. 75? Third row. 85, sir. Yeah, yeah go on, sir. 90. 95. 95. I've got 100. 110, that takes me out, so 110. 110? <laughs> David, what can I say? I've got a good eye. That final warning, and we're selling to the room for 110. I'm really oh, no. delighted. Really good. I think they're, they're great buy. Thank yeah. you. Well done. Chuffed with those. Yeah, yeah, very good indeed. I mean, for you, not for me, obviously. She's finished on a high note with those. Finally, David's Jasperware Wedgwood brooch. 40 quid will do me. It should make that. Where are we for this? £100 to start. There we go. Brilliant. £100 to start. So who's got 110 on? Not that it's yes! it should get it. Has he got it? Amazing. Yes, come on. Fantastic. Anybody at 110? 120. <gasps> yes! You've tripled. Oh, I don't even know You're the terminology. 130 now on the internet. Yes! This is a great nice result. Example. Thank you. It's quiet in the room, so final warning then, and that's selling for 130. Wonderful. Josiah Wedgwood, thank you very much mm. indeed. Do appreciate that one. I need it, Izzy. Well I need it. Well done, you. Yes, five profits out of five. Izzy did good, but David did better. Well, I am trying to be modest, but I've seen the ducks out there. Aren't they gorgeous? Have a look. I feel like you're going to play oh. a trick on me. Yeah. I'm going to try and look this way whilst looking at you at the same time. <laughs> Private celebration, <laughs> Izzy, that's all. <laughs> no, you deserve it. In which Thank case, you. David, you can buy me the drink tonight with all those profits you've just made. I will, including a tub of ice cream. Oh, thank How you. How do you fancy that? I'm an expensive ice cream person. Well, ice cream on me. <laughs> Izzy started out with £186.06, and, and after auction costs, she made a very nice profit, which means that now she has £251.56. Well done. While David began with £148.42 and, and also after costs, he made an even bigger profit. So he now has £328.62p. Come on then, ice cream on me. Ha <laughs> ha! It's good that, wasn't it? Lordy, he actually meant it. <laughs> <laughs>